Sanjeeva and Dr. Shantan. Uh, we are from a company called WS2, but well, I'm kind of from a company called WS2. Uh, I am uh, not an employee anymore, but I still work on WS2. Like oxygen. 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 That, that was the original theme. Can, can I speak with all this? You can hear? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, we need to come in front. Do you want to come in front a little bit, or you can hear okay? Or? Okay, all right. Um, I want to stay in the back because all the fruits and the right. are there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, uh, so Barreta is a language that we've been working on. I'll, I'll get into what, why we're doing it and how it works and what's different and so forth. Uh, it's a programming language that we started creating in 2016. Uh, there are about uh, 50 plus engineers who have been working on it since about 2000, uh, late 2016 we started uh, Going. And uh, there's a whole, whole set of things around the language that we are building as well. So the goal of today is uh, actually before we get started, uh, I, this was mentioned earlier as well. Uh, this this the, the structure for today's uh, session is to be a hands-on uh, program. Right? So so there's a there's a little bit of talking and there's a bunch of code. Right? And uh, the code uh, the, so we are going to deep basically. I will do most of the talking. Something goes to the code. And the code, we are going to show the code. The code's on. If you've grown the repo, you have the code. Uh, we'd like you to run it and do a little bit of stuff with it. Uh, there's more code that we can get through in the session. Uh, so hopefully you can look at it later. There's also, if you go to the Ballerina website, ballerina.io, there's a lot of content there. There's training material, there's uh, uh, documentation, all kinds of stuff there that people can look at. Um, so it's a pretty packed agenda in terms of what we would like to try to cover. Uh, if you don't get through everything, the slides will be checked into the repo as well, and the uh, files are there, so, so it's, it's okay. Okay, uh, let me start with introducing the language. Uh, so a, the, the kind of uh, technical tagline we're using is that Ballerina is a, is a programming language for network distributed applications. So let, let me explain uh, those words. So it is a full programming language. It's not a domain specific language, it is not a, a, a template, anything like that. It's a complete language that starts with defining what numbers are, goes all the way up to defining what abstract concepts are. So it has the standard data types, inversion, everything is true and uh, true and yeah, It's very true. <laughs> <laughs> it's, got, it's got everything. And it defines everything from the bottom up, everything from what an integer is to what a string is, what a float is, what a decimal is. I only emphasize, I'm usually not this kind of nitpicking, but we heard talks where people claim something mm -hmm. and I want to know the standard. Mm -hmm. And when this I is say, you want this and then accept the standard. So if you say yes, yes. But it's complete, it can mean everything. It can program anything. Absolutely, yes. yes. It's not meant to be used by everything. That's what the third bullet says. It is a general purpose language, but it is optimized for writing network distributed applications. So when you look at programming languages, you can look at C, you can look at C++, Java, Go, Rust, Swift, Python, PHP. They all have spaces when the language is optimal to use. You can write a C compiler in Python if you really want to. Or in PHP if I want to be crazy. Or in JavaScript, but you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't write an operating system in JavaScript. Some tried some time ago to write an operating system in Java. The Java was project. Bad idea, basically. Go is perfectly good for certain things. Ballerina has a certain niche it's really good for. And that's what we call network distributed applications. A quick question again. Why is it network distributed applications? Excellent not question. Only, not only distributed applications. Excellent oh, question. Sorry. Absolutely. Perfect timing. Excellent question. Uh, the reason is a, every programming language, almost all programming languages that are around today that are widely used, were designed at a time when the way you wrote a program was to use components that are running on the same machine. You use a library, you use DLL, you use JAR files, whatever mechanism, you import something, you use something on the same machine. But in the, in the cloud world, the normal thing is no longer using something on the same machine, but making a network call. Right? So it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a, everything I do is using something that is somewhere else on the internet. It's the normal thing now. Especially in the enterprise, there is no thing you can do anymore 
where you don't use some third party cloud service. And there are basically no companies that don't use any kind of external services. Everybody uses some kind of services. And more and more, everything is dependent on external services. Uh, so, the, so what is normal programming is now a, is to consume services and produce services. Now, it's, it is not a distributed programming language. That is in Valida, you cannot write the program that when you compile it runs on a set of machines. Right? It is a single process programming language with which you can write network distributed programs. You still need to run multiple of these programs to get a distributed deployment of the system. You said to run multiple of this program. Oh, or different different same programs same. So it could be the same program if you're running in a container environment, you want to scale it up. You might use uh, instances in multiple containers, uh, but it could be that you have. Oh, don't worry, we can continue this fashion. It could be that you get different functionality coming uh, from. Uh, uh, we had this before. The yeah, whole before. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, it goes out. Yeah. It sometimes okay. uh, But it could be that you're running different programs in different modes as well. Right? A quick question. 40 years ago, people introduced remote procedure calls. Yes. So why is that not sufficient? Why? How do you distinguish yourself? I should pay you because you're asking the questions that go. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I will come back to that one in a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the other part, uh, the other part of network distributed, you'll probably have to cool down and come back up. So I said network distributed applications. Uh, okay. Uh, and network distributed, I explained applications. So Balina is not meant to be a systems programming language. We are not trying to replace Go for writing Kubernetes. Right? Uh, you can do that if you want, but that's not the goal. The goal is to an application programming language. Application means a, uh, the ability to write things that people uh, use one layer above, right? not in the systems level. Okay. <clears throat> and, and, the, the, uh, and, and also, there's a trade-off often, uh, if you're familiar with the language called Rust, which is something that Mozilla came up with during uh, Firefox. Uh, Rust gives you incredible performance, uh, performance control and concurrency control, but it comes at a massive price. The price is you have very difficult programming parameters. Right? Ballerina trades off saying we don't mind giving up a little bit of ultimate compute performance for easier to write code. For what? For easier to write code. Ah. Right? right and modify. So one of the other characteristics that we see in, in enterprise code is you write the code once, it gets read and modified for about 50 times in, in real world. You, you never write a program and you, you're done with it and it gets used for the rest of your life. It doesn't happen in the real world. Right? It's only in a, in, a, in a class, you write a program, you submit it, you're done with it, you never look at it again. Right? No real program works like that. Uh, so, so the goal of Paradigm has to be a language sort of application program. Now let me come to uh, the design principles behind the language. Uh, so the first one is, is a, a mod is a classification that Microsoft came up with a long time ago when they were um, when they designed uh, uh, tools and and uh, they, they classified developers into three categories: Einstein, Mod, and Elvis. Right? I'm not sure the history of the words, but that's what they used. Right? What was the first one? Einstein. Einstein. Yeah, Einstein basically is high-end program. You can throw anything at them; they'll figure it out. Because they are extremely intelligent, fully committed, they will not sleep for three days, they will figure out whatever the junk you put uh, them, they are really, really good. Uh, the programs. Elvis are people who, who are basically, a spreadsheet is the maximum they can get to. Right? Mod are the people who you find in everyday enterprise development. From Mortal, mere Mortal. Maybe from mere Mortal, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Uh, that could be actually. I don't know where Elvis comes from. Maybe Elvis was a bit of a. He's always alive. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ballerina's scope is that Ballerina should be usable by mod. That is, it shouldn't be too complicated for a, a normal programmer to understand and to write effective programs that work really well. Right? So we don't expect you to be an Einstein programmer to be able to write really good programs in Ballerina. So only to compare, Java is also a mod language? Um, Java was very much a mod language when it started. Java more and more is not a mod language. Java is a language. It's becoming more of an Einstein language. So more around the framework, the amount of stuff you need to know in order to use Java effectively has gone up quite a lot. 
And now more and more, if you look at the, the reactive programming aspects and so forth that Java is producing, uh, it is you can't look at the code and understand what the code is doing anymore. Yes. Ruby on Rails? Uh, very special case. Ruby on Ruby is a different is the language. Ruby on Rails is a framework. As a framework, it's perfectly good. Uh, if, if that framework works, it's very effective. So it's what? Uh, yes. It's uh, another part, in the, in the design needs to be familiar. That is, most programmers are now familiar with some C++ heritage language, uh, either C++ or C Sharp or Java or JavaScript. So we, we follow the same syntactic paradigms of C++. C++ as a result. It's also not a research project. It is a, it is an industry language. So there are no experimental language theory concepts in there. We try to take things that are well understood in the program language world and bring it in a, in a cohesive form. Right. Uh, a, a, a point there is when you design a language, you never do everything with ideas that you have. Right? You take ideas from all kinds of different people and you blend them together and try to find a blend that works really well. Uh, Java did that primarily from C++ and, and Smalltalk. Uh, C Sharp built up a lot from Java. And, and so forth, right? So every language learns a lot from other languages and tries to build something better. And that's what we are doing as well. Uh, readability is very important. Again, we expect the code to be written once and read way more times. That means when I open somebody else's code, I should be able to understand what this code does without having to spend days understanding the location and so forth. Uh, another part is to design the language along with the set of the tools that go with the platform. Uh, let me explain that in a second. Uh, so language, language basically means what is defined in the specification. It's a syntax, it's a semantics of the language. The platform means everything around the language to make it work. In today's development world, uh, uh, if you go back to when C++ was first written in the late 70s, uh, or late 80s, sorry, uh, it, it was, uh, there was something called C front written, which was a pre-compiler basically that converted C++ to C. And that's how C++ was compiled initially. A, and that's all you had to do at that time. There was no IDE, there was no testing, there was no documentation. These concepts didn't exist. Now, when you have programming language, you have to think about the entire life cycle of software development and see how it fits into that whole tool chain, whole life cycle. So that's what we're doing in Parallel. We we're not designing only the language, we design the language, implementation, the tooling, uh, the life cycle management, the project structure, documentation, testing, that entire platform is being developed. Otherwise, you can't. You can't uh, can't be a competitive language in these days. Okay, so kind of unique as a programming language. Uh, so there are two fundamental things that make it absolutely unique that no other programming language has. And it's these two things. One is it has first class concepts of providing and consuming services. Right, so network awareness is inherent in the language. The idea of services, the idea of consuming services, and all the challenges wow. that come along with it are inherent in the language. Right? Um, so the second a, a, and also, that's inherently concurrent. Uh, services are naturally concurrent, right? So, if you think about a program, when I write a program, if I have a main in a program, when I run the program, that's the only place that executes. My main starts running. Right? In a service, when I open a service, I open up a network port, every time I accept a connection, I get a new socket. Right? So, that means I can have multiple sockets connected at the same time. So, there's an inherent concurrency in service computing that you cannot go away from. <clears throat> so Valerina understands that and builds an inherently concurrent model for, for the service set. The second important point is sequence diagrams. Uh, second point is sequence, sequence diagrams. Ah. So the wait for this come to the second okay. point that you, you should look at while I'm explaining the story. Well, welcome to Europe. <laughs> well, no, this is what always teach you lectures that only Japan and Germany have a highly secure power net. Really? Well, we can't have I thought it was Switzerland also. Um, so no, no, I'm in Japan, yeah. this is why you don't sell a cell USB. Right? Very low market. But you increase the need. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yes. Okay, so sequence diagrams. So sequence diagrams are, are a very well known concept, right? Uh, okay. One of the things about Balina uh, uh, is that the sequence diagram view of a program is an inherent part of every program. And you'll see that as we go along. And it plays two roles. It plays the role of representing network interaction and also representing concurrency. So, so if you remember a sequence diagram, you say these are the different actors and you have different interactions between them and so forth. And the idea is the actors are independent processes, right? That work on their own timeline and they only synchronize whenever there's a line going across between them. So that's a concurrency part. 
That is a better in a programming model for concurrency is exactly that. Right? And so the language has been designed to be aligned with sequence diagrams that way. And for networking, we model a network endpoint as a sequence diagram. So that's not a that's concurrent performance in a different way because it's concurrent and I'm not in control of it. It's running over somewhere else and I'm only exchanging messages. We model both in the same 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 way in Ballerina. Uh, what that does is every program you write in Ballerina has an automatic graphical representation. And it is not a picture that we draw from the program, it is the program. So you can edit the code both graphically in a sequence diagram view as well as textually in syntax view. And there's no difference, you're editing the same underlying syntax for your language. Right? So it has a dual syntax basically for the language. And in the tool that we developed that for Visual Studio Code has uh, both support. And you, you see that in the examples and hopefully you can try it out as well. Uh, there's a plugin by the way for uh, for Ballerina, I for mentioned that. So after you get VS Code, if you if you uh, search in the extension store in VS Code, you can find the Ballerina plugin. Uh, come back to RPC question, uh, and, and uh, Ballerina is not an object-oriented programming language. That is by design. Right? Uh, the reason, the re so object, what does object-oriented mean? That means it's data class code. The, the reason for that is objects are the wrong paradigm for network programming. Because uh, you cannot send, uh, the, the idea of network transparency, remote procedure calls, the, the entire thesis behind remote processor calls is the remote processor call is just like a procedure call, except happens to be remote. Except there's also this called the seven fallacies of distributed computing, which says you really can't make remote things look like local things. Because so many things go wrong. So, so the idea of remote processor calls simply doesn't work because you can't hide the network away to the programmer and say, well, it's just like a procedure call. So, uh, so network transparency doesn't work in, in, uh, for, for distributed computing. Second part is the other way of dealing with objects is to think of how oh, I'm serializing the object from here and sending it over there. But actually you're not serializing the code. Right? You're only serializing the data of the object sending over there, assuming the other side has the same code. So you can load up that data into another instance of that code. That introduces significant time coupling because that means both sides have the exact same version of the object on both sides, which is not a scalable solution for internet scale computing. So basically it is not a paradigm that works for distributed computing at scale. So we don't, Ballerina is not an object oriented language as a result. So uh, this is a little bit of a challenge because especially for people who come from a Java kind of mindset where everything is an object, Ballerina is quite a challenge because you have to think in terms of data first, not objects, just the data. And like you did in C time, right? Where you define records and you just kind of manipulate the data. And if you want an object, you can you can have an object, no problem. You have an object model, uh, there's a way to define an object and have isolated code and data, no problem. But you don't do that for everything by design. So I'm sorry, but really understand that serialization is not only of data, but also of code? No, no, no. There is no, 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 no. Serialization is only of the data. And Ballerina avoids this problem by saying the way you program network interactions is with data, not ah. with objects. Ah, okay, okay. If you want to use objects in your program, you can do that. Okay. But that's not the one used for network interaction. Yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, the other one is the whole spectrum of typing. Stat strong versus static versus dynamic typing. Uh, so, so the basic idea of strong typing is that a, a, you don't expose the memory to the programmer directly. And you manage it somehow. Right? The programmer has to see every bit of memory from a particular length. So it's a number, therefore I can only do these things. It's an array of length 10, therefore I can only do these things. Right? That's what a strong typing is. Ballerina is strongly typed, and so is every other modern programming language. Because nowadays we don't ever want to go to the C style buffer overrun kind of problem. Right? Uh, static typing means you do all the type checking and compile time. Dynamic typing means you do more checks at you do checks at runtime. Uh, it's a trade-off because if you do something at compile time, that means you get more rigidity. If you do something at runtime, you get more flexibility. But this flexibility comes instantly because sometimes your program might get tested all good, but one particular path might cause a type error to occur at runtime. If it's statically checked, that cannot happen because the compiler guarantees that it doesn't happen. Uh, so, so it's a trade-off. We have a uh, what we've done in Ballerina is to find a sort of middle point where we do a lot of static time checking, but there's a few things pushed off runtime in order to make the static experience more tolerable. 
you'll see that as we go along. Another, another interesting thing is again coming back to network uh, spread aspects is the use of a type system versus the concept of a schema. You look at XML schema, JSON schema, and so forth. These are ways of describing data that goes on, on over the wire. And type system is a way of describing data that you manipulate in the program. Right? The disconnect between these two is what's called data binding. If you look at in the Java world, in the web services world, there's a concept of data binding all the time, which is I take some data that comes over the net, I bind it over some data structure that I have over the, in my program. And so it's, it's a mapping between the schema language and the type language. In the case of ballerina, uh, so and and, uh, and and when 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 they don't match, it creates a lot of friction because you, you have a you have a data that might match, might not match, so it creates lots of problems. And what we've done in Ballerina is quite unique. The type system for Ballerina also works as a schema language because the type system describes data first. So that part of the type system is actually a complete schema language. And it can be, it's, uh, it's got the capability to describe a shape of a value that is using structural typing, the Ballerina types in the structure. So we can describe the shape of a value. Uh, we can say that the and, and the way types are defined is just as by a set of uh, values, so it's that, that defined it results what's called semantic subtyping. Um, there's union, untagged union uh, capability, so you can say what I get over the network is this or this, and, and it gives a way of describing that kind of behavior, and extensibility yeah, with open records. That means often when I want to exchange information with somebody else, I'm interested in these fields being there, and I don't really care whether there's additional fields. I'm not going to mess with it, so let it be. That's open records, right? So the schema language, the, uh, the, the type system of Ballerina is a line variable to a, a schema language as well. Right? Uh, and therefore, the concept of data binding is gone. All you have to do is type cast. You have a value from one type, you declare another type, and you say just cast it to this type, and that's data binding. So there is no separate concept of data binding anymore in Ballerina. TypeScript, which is a, a typed uh, version of JavaScript uh, that Microsoft has done, is somewhat similar to this. Uh, the language is data structures. The, uh, there's this quote by Alan Curtis about uh, the difference between having different kinds of data structures versus the finite number of data structures. So some languages like Java, for example, uh, has an open-ended set of data structures. Uh, and you have libraries of all kinds of data structures. You have stacks and queues and this kind of stacks and this kind of queues, all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, the, the inherent language doesn't have any data structures. It has the primitive types, and then you can build whatever you want. Uh, Ballerina takes a very different approach. There's the primitive values, and there are two kinds of data structures: maps, and uh, basically the mappings and lists. Lists are ordered values, so there's a positional index that goes from zero and whatever length there are, and mappings are indexed values based on some kind of identifier. Right? Uh, and then there are two kinds of uh, Two kinds of mappings, two kinds of lists. We'll get into details of that as we go along. And this all samples to be an exact match for JSON. That means every JSON value is actually a Ballerina value. So if I have a Ballerina type that is defined, I want to send over the wire as JSON, I can just write that thing out and I can JSON. So it's a very, uh, it gives a very direct mapping to JSON out there. Uh, the other interesting thing about writing network applications and making them resilient is error handling. And the way you handle errors has a huge impact on, on the way people use the program language. Uh, there's a lot of history on how people have handled errors in different languages. Uh, Ballerina takes a very a, a strict view about errors. The, the idea is basically errors are another kind of value that never overlaps with any other kind of value. So, so uh, unlike in C, if you remember, the way you return an error it is by returning minus one. Right, you take a value which is outside the expected result set and you return that so the caller can check whether I got that uh, unusual value and then you know something went wrong. In Ballerina, because of union types, we can say, okay, this function returns this kind of thing or it's an error. And the caller can check, did I get an error? And, and, uh, and gives a way to manage errors very cleanly. And also, we can force the programmer to always have to check errors. And then we give a set of rules to make it easy to manage that. Because ignoring errors is the number one reason for network applications being not stable. Right? 
if you go through everything, you know, you press buy, it seems like it bought, but nothing happens. That's because something went wrong, we keep on reading some program, we load it, and it fails. And later on in the level, you don't know what went wrong. Uh, just to clarify a couple of things with the Java and Arena, the first implementation we've done is generating bytecodes and runs on top of the JVM. But Ballerina's semantics are not defined on top of the JVM. It's not optimized for the JVM. JVM is not the target for the language. It is designed to be a language with multiple implementations. We want a JVM-based implementation. We are working also on a, on a native implementation using LLVM to have a full native compilation. We also want to have a web-based implementation uh, and, and, and other implementations. Right? So, so there are so it's not there's no Java connection between the language whatsoever. No semantics of Java are linked into Ballerina. Uh, yeah. It is also an open source. Uh, so it's important to understand what open source language means. So the language specification is a document. It's not source code. So the word open source doesn't apply to documents. It applies only to source code. Uh, Ballerina's implementation is open source. Ballerina's specification is under a Creative Commons license. Right. So I don't want Creative Commons. Ah. So anybody can look at it, and, uh, and we, I think we put a uh, no derivatives license. So if somebody wants to derive something from it, they have to come back and talk to us. Otherwise, we'll create forks of the language that we don't want. Uh, the way the language is being version managed is we, we have a version scheme where we say 2000 year and then release 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, so right now, we are almost about to release 2019 R2. Uh, there will be a small fixed up version of R3 coming out. That will be what's the basis for the First Java implementation will be completed, and then we'll keep going like this. So there's no version one concept. It's just language to keep on evolving. Uh, there, there are two levels of stability in the language: a sort of a base level and an experimental level. Base level means we, we think we got it right. Uh, there could be some problems. We might need to tweak it a little bit, but we think we got it right. Experimental means there are some things that are going to change here. Currently, XML and tables are marked as experimental, and, 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 and transactions. And, Things the markets, but maybe there's some evolution that we have to do. And when you get a version of the platform, everything is done. Uh, so by end of this year, we expect to have XML and tables fully done. Uh, next year, we have uh, early next year, we'll be in short stream and very transactions. Uh, everything is done through GitHub. The spec is in GitHub. Uh, there are issues you can open in GitHub. If you, and you can track uh, discussions, conversations, all in GitHub. For this particular session today, we are using the version of Arena called 0.9910, which predates the latest version scheme. And this is not fully aligned with the R2 spec concepts that are that are coming out. There are some small differences. Uh, so, so whatever the code you are using today and, and what, what you learn today, there will be some minor tweaks coming up when the R2 release comes out uh, in the July. Okay, uh, any questions before I uh, go forward and explain the type system at high level and we start looking at some code? Yes? Um, so typically, if you send a request to any, let's say, website, mm -hmm. right? what you do is to do some calculations, monitor something, and sometimes you store it in a database. Yep. Um, so, does Balanita itself provide some purpose for that, or is it kind of in JBAL, you know, use JPC or? No, no, no. no. Yeah, there is, yeah. Uh, uh, so we treat databases as network resources, yeah. and uh, we haven't uh, we haven't attempted to abstract the query language away. But as in the query language, if you're talking MySQL, you must use MySQL and SQL. If you're talking to Oracle, you must use Oracle, yeah. SQL, and so forth. Uh, but there is a connector application. We will we have some samples of that coming up as well of talking to data. So so Valida is trying to address the full spectrum of writing network applications. So there's data on the back end, there's logic, and there's the wire on this side. Not the UI part, we're not dealing with the front end UI part of it, but to communicate to the front end these services and APIs. So we cover that whole spectrum. So we don't store the data, we don't create the UI, but everything in between, that it has an answer for. Or has an opinion on. I only wanted to reflect on what you said. So what I heard mostly from your side is we have the same language concept, but like any other program language, we only redefine sometimes the semantics. Or are there unique language constructs that I cannot find in any other program? Yes, there are many unique language constructs that you will not find in any other program. Okay, so it makes it also syntactically different. 
uh, the syntactic principles are similar. Yeah, of course. As in, you know, curly braces yeah, 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 yeah. that kind of stuff. But you have, for example, special special keywords. Yes, yeah, like lots of special keywords. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's very different. It's not an extension of some other language. It's an entire language designed from the beginning to the top. You have iteration, recursion, <coughs> procedures, functions, and blah, blah, blah. So you only package that syntactically, not totally different, but quite different. Yes. Well, okay. I'll be patient. Yes. Okay, anything else? Okay, let me briefly explain the type system and then we'll look at some code here. It's more useful to get code as well. Uh, so Ballina has a structural type system. Uh, the way that idea works is that the, uh, we look at data that we operate from a universe of values. So if you look at the universe of all values, Ballina can only represent a certain kind of values. So that is the basic set of things. That, that's the set of things a Ballina program can manipulate. Right? It's all tell that you cannot manipulate that. So what is that space of values? So we have three kinds of values. There are simple values, which are things like numbers, uh, booleans, and so forth, which are atomic, conceptually atomic. As in, they don't live based on something else. They are things by themselves, right? Integers, floating point numbers, uh, decimals, strings, booleans, things like that. They are the, the, the simple values. And then you have structured values, which are mappings and lists. Those are the only two kinds of structured values that we have, uh, which create new values using the other values. So that's one level of construction. And then you have behavioral values that are uh, things like functions, which are taking a bits of the value in a program and allowing you to treat it as values. So functions, objects, uh, and a few other things like that. So Ballina is also, if you want to write a completely functional program in Ballina, you can do that. It doesn't force you to do that, but you can certainly do that. So, so these are the only three kinds of values that we represent in Ballina. So everything that you do in Ballina is built up with these kinds. It will become clear as you go along. Uh, in order to build the type system up, there is one other concept you have to understand, which is this concept of a shape. So the shape of a number is a number itself. So the shape of 13 is 13. Because it's an atomic thing, it has no other information. But the shape of a structured thing, uh, so if you have a set of persons, there's a common shape for the set of persons. Right? They have a certain set of attributes that are common to all people. Uh, so shape abstracts that, that commonality of all those values, and that's a shape. Right? So when you define a type in Ballina, what you're defining is classifying the shape. And then a type itself is just a set of shapes. So if I say, a, if I define a type as uh, a person that has a name and an age, then the set of all values which maintain the same shape belong to that type. Right? So as long as something has a name and an age, that's of that type. Okay? I'm confused. You start with shape and said the shape looks like name and age. Shape abstracts some information from the value yeah. and lets you look at the value abstract. So, so yeah. if I so you look at the structure. Look at the uh, look at the structure, exactly. So if I look at an atomic thing, there is no structure. Yes. Therefore, the value is a shape. There is max 32. Yeah. That's it. Yes. There is 32. But if I look at a, a structure, a more of a structured thing, then there is a shape. I look at only the structure. So the structure defines basically the membership criteria to be a member of that type. So we define as a type the set of all shapes that belong to that type. It will become clear as we go along through, through the course. I'm so confused. But okay. okay. We will we'll, we'll skip, skip a few more slides and then you'll, you'll see the, the, the code that you get. Um, and also, because it's structurally tied, the same shape can belong to many sets. So, for example, a set that has a field uh, of type string called name and a field of type uh, ink called age can also have other. Uh, <coughs> Other shapes that have additional fields. With my own requirements, you must have at least these two fields. Right? If you have additional fields, that's fine, you're still in the same set. So a given value has many types as a result of that. Right? The type of a value comes from the shape of the value. And because a given value can satisfy many shapes, you can have many types. Again, don't, don't worry too much about this. 
And the way you describe a type is by defining a membership test to be a member of that set. So all typing in Valerina is defined in terms of sets. A type is conceptually a set of values. Let me ignore the shape yes. for a second. A type is just a set of values. Yes. And a subtype, therefore, is a subset of values. Yes. So that, that is called semantic subtyping. Um, and and, a, uh, and and the shape will come along as we go along, so it's not quite much about the shape. Still, I want to have to form you one sentence that defines the shape because I'm still confused. Okay. Shape is an abstraction of the of a particular value. So so for so an integer shape. Uh, no no no. A, a integer is a is a type that holds all shapes of integer form. So integer type holds everything from minus whatever to the 64 64 minus one yes. to not infinity because these are 64 bit integers. Okay. So it's a mathematic, it's not mathematical integers, it's okay. not natural numbers. Okay. Yeah. The enumeration, the age is between zero and two hundred maximum. That's this it. would be a shape. That would be a shape. Okay. That's right. So byte, for example, in Valerina. Why is the values between zero and a hundred, which I call H type, not a type, and a shape, but a shape. No, no, no. It, it is, it is, a, it is a, sorry, it is a type. It's a, it's a type that consists of the shape 0 to 100. So ah, let's, yeah, say ah, byte. Yeah. let's say byte as an example. If you notice, it's, I'll explain this picture in a second. Uh, if you look at byte, there is no primitive type in Valerina called byte. Which seems really crazy because bytes are very fundamental in computers, right? But what is a byte? A byte is just a number between 0 and 25. There is no at an abstract value concept, there is no thing called a byte. We got fall in love with the byte in the programming world because the computer has the eight bits of memory and everything's organized on groups of eight bits of memory. Now implementation of the compiler of course optimizes when it sees a byte, it doesn't go and allocate memory at you know 64 bit integer quantities to represent bytes, because it knows the maximum number you can put in there is 25. But the type byte in Ballerina is just a union of the numbers 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 all the way up to 255. But does it also mean that if I, let's say that my first range is between 1 and 100 and then I have to extend it to 100 so I have to change that in the whole variable where it's been used which has a particular type and extend this from one, uh, to 200 so I have to do a lot of rework, right? Um, if you intentionally define a type which is 0 to 100, yeah. and then later you decided that I want the type. Ah, if you're defining the type number, the type can just do it once and you define the exactly. new range. Right. And automatically, the variables of that type are allowed to carry a range of variables. Yes, exactly. Right. So type is a set criteria. So you define the membership criteria for the set. Once you define it, any value of that set can be chucked into that type. Uh, so in a very conceptual explanation of the, of the time system, you'll see this in four in a second. Uh, so the set of all values, which is represented by the universal type, right, is uh, we have a concept called a type called any, which can represent any normal value and error, which represent error. So at the highest level, errors are separate from everything else. Right? And within any, you have simple types. So this this one is is nil, that's the type, the special value group said I have nothing. Uh, and then you have boolean in flow of test constraint, right, on one side, and then structural types are arrays and tuples, uh, and map record table, etc. Right? We'll, we'll get into all this, you we'll see in the types of uh, code. So what's the difference between record and tuple? Uh, records are key, uh, they're mappings basically. So records and maps are both mappings. Tuples and arrays are lists. The difference is lists are integer indexed. Uh, starts at zero, goes on to all the list is. Mappings are string indexed. Keys. I call called tuples and records. So what is the difference between a tuple and a uh, tuple is limited? No. No. Tuple is ordered. Order. Tuple is ordered. Record is the key. Because the key is the first. Ah, OK. Ah, ah, I see. Yeah. That's a good thing. And what's the difference between the parenthesis type and the empty type? Uh, the empty type is a type that has no values in it. Okay. Parenthesis thing is a special type that has just that value. The type can just do it once and define a new range. 
which automatically the variables of that types are allowed to carry the train to the Yes, exactly. So type is a set criteria. So you define the membership criteria for a set. Once you define it, any value of that set can be chucked into that type. And that's it. Uh, <coughs> so in the very conceptual explanation of the, of the type system, you'll see this in code in a second. Uh, so the set of all values, which is represented by the universal type, right, is uh, we have a concept called a type called any, which can represent any normal value and error, which represent error value. So the highest level errors are separate from everything else. Right? And within any, you have simple types. So this this one is is, is nil. That's the type the special value that represents uh, nothing. Uh, and then you have boolean in flow of plus constraint. Right on one side, and then structural types are arrays and tuples, uh, and map record table, etc. Right? We'll, we'll get into all of this. You see in the types of uh, code. So what's the difference between record and tuple? Uh, records are Key, uh, they're mappings basically. So records and maps are both mappings. Tuples and arrays are lists. The difference is lists are integer indexed, uh, starts at zero, goes on to all the list is. Mappings are string indexed, keys. I call for tuples and records. So what is the difference between a tuple and a uh, tuple is limited? No. No. Tuple is ordered. Ordered. Tuple is ordered, record is the X of key. Ah, ah, okay. Ah, ah, I see. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good conclusion. And what's the difference between the parenthesis type and the empty type? Uh, the empty type is a type that has no values in it. Okay. Parenthesis thing is a special type that has just that value.
internet repository I have to again download additional files so it may need a moment
Visual Studio Code? No, you need that now. Ah, I need that to open uh, source. So you continue to help me. On 20 feet now. Just download my app. Visual Studio Code. Good to keep going. So you have downloaded that. So let's uh, open the project. Uh, and just expand the types directory. So you can find a set of files. So you can see that uh, the extension of these files is not bad.
So you can use that when you are using that module, uh, maybe it's uh, functions and maybe it's a style. So this is one way to use one of the functionality from an important module and other one is using an alias from uh, the IEO module and important, importing that as a, a, with a, name, a different name called console. Just invoke one of the functions from that and just pass in this value, which will just print the, uh, the value i. So the difference between this and this is that we are importing it as a as using another. So you can just run that and also see. So then you might be useful to show how to work. Explain that we have three different uh, three different values. Uh, one is a simple value and structured and the behavior value. So this is I'm um, just showing the simple values such as int, string, and uh, float. Uh, previous example I showed the float, and we also have boolean. Uh, you can type boolean here and uh, decimal, real. So those kind of simple values. So how do you define an integer? It's visible in other programs as well. I can just okay. It needs to be visible across all the other modules. So if you report this to some other module, so this public variables or public variables and types will be visible. I think I didn't understand. Can I change the type of constant later on in the code? No, no. Okay, so what's the difference between constant and final? And there you go. We had a, the keyword was called final earlier. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. That would have been a little bit. Ah. And the compiler still has some older versions that have been supported because they are moving things along. Sorry. So, so final doesn't exist. No, no, no. It's constant. No, it's Is that there are 
local names and their, their modularity is a concept of a module. The module consists of a number of files. We collect all the symbols from the module into one, all those files into one, one single space. And then modules can export names to other people. And that's asked uh, explicitly? Which is in public. Okay. Yes. Only the public symbols of a module are visible to other modules. When you import, you can only see the public symbols of the module. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like the Go package, the Go module, mm -hmm. not the Java one. And as soon as I see it, I have one of the keywords that says this data should be visible. Uh, in C, you mm -hmm. know. Yes. Uh, that's within C, within a class you have. Uh, 
So if you go to the right hand side, show where the button is. That button there, the second button on the top part, that shows you the sequence diagram view of the program. So if you click on that one, click on that one, you get a second screen of the link, it's close to the Explorer screen. Now, this is showing you for each function the corresponding sequence diagram. So this lets you see the whole program as a diagram. You want to see each part of what's happening. It shows you what's happening in every part of the program in the sequence diagram. This, this becomes a lot more interesting when you have concurrency and network stuff happening inside those functions. How did you get the last one? Uh, yeah, so okay. it's good. 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 And then on the next to the edit button on top, yeah. you see, don't press it, it says expand code. Ah, ah. So you click on that one, it expands the, because what, what this picture shows is just the interactions between yes, 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 the so workers only. Right. Expand yeah. the code, you expand that. Right. Then it shows you wherever there is code, the scroll down is, right? yeah, yeah. And you see the lines of code. And if you go to any one of these lines of code, if you mouse over it, you get an edit button here. Yeah. Click on that one, it will show the sequence diagram of that one ah, right at that spot. Very nice, okay. So that function call is actually just this sequence diagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a boring sequence diagram, yes, but yes, shows yes, the yes. point. We'll get to a more interesting one later. And then you can edit these pictures, and if you edit this picture, you edit the code. There is no difference. So it's a one-to-one correspondence. Yes, so just go to the same function yeah. above, and just edit. Button. Yeah. Right. Now you can do only a few things here. So like, you know, yeah. we, we only allow you to graphically edit things that have graphical representation. You don't let you write the code graphics. It's kind of pointless. So put a while shape or something. Now on the left hand side you see a while okay. shape. It's the same thing. But here you see in a more graphical form.
this case, this variable value is of type string or int or name. So that means the variable value can accept uh, values of these three different types. So you can see that I assign integer as the first one, and then I assign a string, and then I assign the name. So finally, the value will have the name. But I cannot find out what the type of its current value is. Yeah. Okay. So to use it, can you just write down that type? So you can't use the value because the value's type is a union. Yeah. So you can't add one to it, for example, no. without checking whether it's an integer. Yes. So you can say if value is int. Now inside that if statement, value is now an integer. Now you can say value because value plus one. Okay. So it's called a type guard. So this guarantees that the compiler, the runtime, this is a runtime check now. If the runtime type of that value is an integer, this if statement will execute. Yep. But you have to check by yourself all the time. It's not like it's internally converted automatically. No, 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 there is no conversion. It's a unit. So remember, think from a set point of view, right? You have the set of all strings, set of all integers, and the other. This variable has been declared as it can hold a value from this union of the values. Yeah, sure, but what I mean is here you're checking values and yes or no. So that you're checking it with, with your code by yourself if it's an integer, yes or no. So you cannot write just value as uh, value plus one. So it's not, not internally recognized by the No, no. So if, if, if we, we know internally, but if you write value equal value plus one, and if value is a string, but what do you want it to do? Runtime error. So we don't want to have runtime errors too much. So then you're so it's a design okay. effect. Design principle to say reduce the number of runtime errors. Programmer has to know what they're doing. Okay. So it's actually a design principle invalid. You're not trying to make it easiest to write a program. You're trying to make it easiest to write a program that can work reliably and does what you expect it to do. So somebody who did value the value plus one probably didn't realize that it might be a string. Sure. There's nothing you can do at runtime but then throw open hands and die at that point. Say, ah, something went wrong. We don't want that to <coughs> as much as possible. Is error also a type? Error is a type as well. We get to the other error example coming yes. in, right? Okay. Yeah. What's this type error in here? Yeah. yeah, error is in the type system. It's just different from all the other types. Yes. So you can yeah. always distinguish between them. Yeah. So it has, it has a communication right, between, I don't know, let's say, let's say we have two workers. And so they are sending the messages to each other. Right. And I have to define string and union oh, and error. Work exactly. The right. oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So every variable I can use with this operator to find out what it's Any like. expression, you can oh, find out expression. Okay. And there's another, there's a concept of type matching that you'll come to later. Yeah. That will show you how you can do more structural decomposition as well. And is there also something like, I forget the right term, compatibility of types? Uh, yes, uh, there is. So, so there is a concept of, uh, the, what this is checking is whether the the value is in that set. So yeah. it's checking the current, the inherent type of that value, whether it is a member of that set. Yes. There is another thing called uh, uh, like, uh, like shape matching. So it's a compatibility check. You're not checking whether the type is this, you're checking whether the shape of this value is okay with the shape I want to look at it as. Oh, I see. The inherent type may be something different, but as long as it has these fields, that's all I care for. Okay. That is called an ease-like test. Do that is like. Yeah. Instead of ease, you're asking is like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, you don't say is like, you don't type matching. You see that. Okay. Um, I guess you can also use unions as parameters to functions. Yes. Yes, yes. They're just types, so you can return. If you, you then um, put an int as a parameter to a union, it doesn't work, and vice versa. So, so you if I have the union parameter type is declared as int or something. All with an int. Yeah. Yes, it works. Then it's just like this example. Mm -hmm. As if this was a parameter and it's been called with a type, so you can't use it without testing the type at runtime. And vice versa, is it also possible to have an int parameter and call it with a union type? No. No. Because then again, think from a set point of view. You yeah, declare yes. this variable can only contain the set of all integers, any value from set of all integers. Now you're trying to give it something that's not in that set. So the compiler says no. What's the reason to, uh, to uh, have this kind of unit? I oh. understand in C, it was done when you had small memory. 
Yeah, yeah no, no, this is completely different. So C C has what's called uh, base yeah, C, C uses unions to over their memory. Yes. Right. Paladin is completely different. Ah, this is this is called a discriminatory union. This is language is discriminatory. In C, once you overlay memory, you used to have another field that told what do I have. That was how it's usually implemented. Right. Because otherwise you don't know which one is where you get memory. Uh, this is done not to make a, a, the particular example that that person asked about network errors. Okay. Because in network scenarios, errors are a very common thing. And you have to always be able to say this function gives me a person or gives me an error. And you can't. The, so it's part of the error handling architecture of the language, you must have unions. And union types are generally useful for network protocols. So it's a combination of will differ but it's very uh, elegant, let's say. Yes. Any other question? Yeah, sorry. So you said it's mainly uh, advantage, the, the main advantage is for error handling because you can say it's something or an error? Yeah, it's not only for error handling. If you have a, uh, if you look at any of the protocol specifications, for network interactions, you'll often see uh, things saying, so for example, the uh, services, you can say authentication that I need is either digest authentication or basic authentication or no auth authentication. Okay. Right? It's a very common kind of scenario right, in network services. So that means that the data that I'm sending is one of these three kinds. So to be able to represent those type of things cleanly, you need units. Special case, but would you say that in general, if you um, consider like something like this, that this is a good example to have something string or integer to, to programming, also so for, for some simple more simple things. No, but uh, how would you do string or integer? Though? Sorry, if I really want to program a string or int, it's not a real example. To yeah, so sure. you should want to program a string or int. If you really want to program a string or int, you need something like this. If not, you need a record that has both string and int in it. And a flag which says which one is the real answer. Right? That is how you do it in C, for example. Or in Java, that's how you do it, right? You create yeah. two properties, a string property and an int property, and another flag that says, do I have a string property or do I have an int property? But then this have, builds that into the language. But then I have the IE support, so. Sorry? So then I have IE support. No, you have IE support here too, completely. But what, what you want to get in the ID, it knows exactly what the type is. Right. So, and even the type, now that type got value is int. Within that block, now values type is known to be int. Okay. So, in, in here, if you do value dot, I don't know if you remember how much you have to inside that, it's a value dot. So, for example, the, okay, these are not there. We have some more methods coming for built in functions. So if there was a written function, it knows what the type is. So ID is fully aware. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, regarding the nil. Um, so it's, so I, I need to union the nil if, if I also want to be allowed to set for value the nil value, right? So the nil, what nil is used to use for is to create this uh, this use case. Consider optional types. You know, in Java 9, they introduce this concept of optional, right? You can wrap a class with another class which says either I have this one or I don't have that. Right. So optional types are saying it's either a string or it's nothing. Uh, okay, so it doesn't mean non initialized, it's really nothing. No, no, it's nothing. It's not non initialized. Okay. There is no non initialized state possible in Valerian. Right? It guarantees that everything is initialized before you. Yes. What is then, let's say, the, the value or the, the initial value of the string and then all the other types if I don't set them to a, a value. So we don't let if you don't set them to a value, first of all you can't read it. Okay. Right? So even Java has to call definite initialization. So in every part it must be initialized. Right? But there are certain cases when you do need an initial default value, for example if an array of integers, arrays in value are pass automatically. So if I assign to if I declare an array of integers and I go and assign to array slot 17 what do you do with 0 to 16? That's called a filler value. That filler value comes from the default value of the type. So if it's int, for example, it is 0. If it's string, it is the empty string. Okay. It is not null. So in yeah. string, so it's important, the string type doesn't have a, uh, has 0 in string as the default value. 
not null. There, there, is no, there is no null invariant. You cannot have a null pointer problem invariant because there is no null. And it's explicit. If you don't have a value, it's explicit. It's optional. So it's question mark is a shortcut syntax for saying string or div. And maybe, maybe it's just because it comes from the Java world, but how can you differentiate between the string is really empty because there is no value and I don't know the value yet. Which uh, so then, then you would use an optional string. You declare it like this. Uh, okay, right? If you declare it like that, that means it has a nil is a legitimate value. So then the default value of that is nil. Okay. That means it has no value, right? Yeah, okay. So it's a very clear distinction between two. Yeah. But you can call this. Hmm? But the difference is that you can call this. Right, you can read the variable, you get a value of type string question mark. And then you I can't say s dot because s may be nil, so you can't do dot. There's something called safe navigation that we'll get to later on. The syntax is going to change slightly to be question mark dot. So if you say s question mark dot, then it does a safe navigation. It checks at runtime whether this is nil. If it's not nil, it continues. If it's nil, it throws an error. Yeah, those two are called this two or something. Yeah. This. What is the default value of a union? Uh, there is a default value of a union is nil if it contains nil, if the union contains nil, otherwise it has no default value. So you can't use you can't have an array of such unions and have filler situations. But by the way, don't know what to put. So, so, so this is a, exactly the, so now because it's into string, there's no default value. So I can't have it be a variable length value when you fit it automatically. So if you put into string question mark, 
that means you're unioning with, so it's, that's why it's an intrastream on here. So I just put intrastream on here. Is that? Yeah, yeah, you do it. Both just, question mark is same as unioning with nil. Now oh. it's, it can be filled automatically because there's nil there, so if I have length of the area, I can put nil. So in the default value, it would be that nil if I'm getting the index 100. That's right. It's not so any more zero? But no, because I don't know. Because they don't know what that's the right. default value yeah. is. No, not for records. For record fields, you can give it for value. There's no syntax. I mean, the only reason is we can't. There's no proper syntax for it. So tuples, so tuples are like arrays, except that they are fixed length, or they can, they could have a rest parameter. But each in an array, it's the same type for each slot in an array. In a tuple, you name the type for each slot. So this one, it says, the first slot is in, second slot is string, third slot is in. Uh, the syntax for tuple, this is the, the current syntax that is supported. We are changing this. The new syntax is going to be using square brackets also. Okay. So the, uh, in the release that will come out end of July, the syntax for tuples will change to square brackets just like arrays. So syntactically, they will look exactly the same. The difference is in a tuple, the way you type a tuple is by, for each slot in the tuple, you give the type, right? And in an array, you say, here's a type, and I have some length of it. So it's a repeating type in an array. In a tuple, you say, I have a three tuple, and one is a person, the other is an int, the other one is a string. So by returning a tuple, it's kind of like having multiple returns. Right? So a function that returns one value can return a tuple as the one value, and the tuple can have a number of values that you want to return. Right? So for the next one, mapping. So, so we have a
Close means one or there's only this set of fields. So we have a syntax for writing the closed record, which is put a vertical bar next to the curly brace. That means this record has only these fields. So if it has additional fields, it doesn't belong to this set. It doesn't belong to this type. If it's an open record, the records are by default open to any data. Any kind of data value can be seen, can be added to that. What by doing stream.dot what Kishan has done is said that particular record is open to strings, additional string value fields only. So you can choose how much you want to leave it open. You can say I don't want to leave it open at all, then I'm declaring a closed record. I can say I want to leave it open to this kind of data, I can open it, leave it open to any kind of data in the record. But this open record is only valid then for additional PS from the side of string. For example, if I have further values which are not only from the type of strings, can I just add additional ones to the string and they just don't get You can, you can just union that if you want. Okay. It's normal type history. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, the dot 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 is what says it's a rest. It's any, any number of things going here. So you can put any union there or you can, if you don't put anything, it's equal to saying any data. Sure. And then you can just, yeah. yeah. You can control how much you want to allow me to do. Assigned to the records field, it's fine. But if you 
have something else here, yeah. then that map cannot be assigned. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. But for example, um, can I say something like I want to say zip code as well? Uh, let's assume it is a string, right? Um, doesn't matter for now. Yeah. Can I say, for example, uh, this map should contain street, city, country, country and zip code? So then, then you shouldn't use a map type, then you should use a record record. Uh, the record type uh, is what lets you control what fields, right? And the record type, this one doesn't show it, also has a concept of uh, defaultable fields. So if you put uh, in the student record, if you say age equals 18 by default, so it says for yeah, the first one, put 18. That means the that field is optional when you create a record. If you don't put it, it becomes 18. And fields also have a concept of optional field records have a concept of optional fields. Do you have an example of that? Then just put that. No, 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 so then that's fine. Put name, put name. So there's a difference between the type being optional and the field being optional. Field being optional means this field may not be there, but if it is there, it's of type string. That is what that syntax is saying. This record may or may not have a field called name. So I'm reading some data from the from, from, from remote uh, service. It may send me field of this kind, but it may not send me a field of this kind. But it sends it of the structure. Yeah. And if I now want to add more fields to person B, do I do it like in Python? Objects, and just put a dot and a new name for So we, we don't, okay. So, so then we add for, for safe type checking safety, we restrict what fields you can use with the dot to those things that we can statically validate are actually defined. The other ones you must use with uh, index sentence. So you can put any field into that. If it's an open record, you can stuff any field into that. But you have to say record square bracket string. And the reason is to basically prevent errors like somebody makes a spelling mistake in a field access. So let's say someone calls a function foo, right, with a person record, p. Okay, and p has name, age, address in it. And, and instead of spelling address with two d's, I put a d like that. I made a spelling mistake. Right? The compiler will not catch this if we don't, if, if because the person is trying to fill in the address field. And, and because it looks like syntax, the compiler still, if, if we don't say these fields that you access to the dot must be defined, the compiler will not catch this. Now, we, we still won't catch this. If you put the same spelling mistake in the square bracket, it's okay. But if you put it like this, it's not okay. Because it looks more like syntax. So we, we enforce rule that what you can access with that syntactic style are things that are declared. Now, there's one tweak on that, which is related to JSON. JSON has something called lax typing, which means we defer the typing to runtime. And because in JSON it is normal to prefer the fields that are not defined, we actually love that. But then I should get an error if I try to do it, right? Uh, at runtime, you could get an error if you access a field that doesn't exist. But, but if you assign a field that doesn't exist, no problem. Just create the field.
set of objective fields. So I have a lot of fields and uh, so like an object constructor in uh, Java, we have this uh, object initializer that is not so that it has a special uh, how you define how you define your own initialize use it with uh, underscore underscore init like that. And it also can take arguments. So if here I have uh, all the fields as arguments and then accessing the object fields is using the keyword called self. So if you want to access your object field within your object method, you have to use the keyword called self. self. So this one basically initializes whatever the values coming from the object unit method and then we assign, assign that to the object fields. And it also has two other methods. Let's see how you create a new object is. Uh, the type name, the variable name, and then you use the new keyword. So this one will be the new. It's basically calling the init constructor. Sorry, the initializer method. So this is basically a function call. So you have to pass whatever the uh, arguments that is ex expected from the init uh, method of an object. This is how you create a new instance of an object. And you can basically call its methods, object method using dot. So the variable name is T1 here and I will just shows what are its fields and what are the methods that you can. Function body, I am creating another function. So this, the 
as another function within this function. So that's why in a function. But we also do support closures. So you can see that this A is uh, defined out. Uh, the scope of the A is uh, the main main function. The scope of the A is defined in the main. But you can see that this can be accessed within the uh, inline function. Messages you can send between one worker and another worker is any data values. There's no code. You can send data basically from one worker to another worker. So here, so when you say data is equal to five, the value of so type of A is actually if, but you can uh, you can't uh, directly use some operations of uh, on, on this variable. Uh, if you are to do that, you have to type assert. Assert means you have to basically say a is of type int. Then, so if you know that this is going to be of type int, you have to assert it using uh, this operation. Search and saying this is of this type. I know what I'm doing. It's of this type. If you got it wrong, you get told around. Okay. Yep. Yeah, but is there something like like a try catch mechanism that I can say I, I want to guard it so it have or uh, have an assertion that it isn't it? But if not, let's do yes. something. So uh, when you get to errors, there's a we'll see that in a second. Okay. The errors and panics. Panics are when you can catch the panic. You can trap the panic. So inference is basically condition based branching and uh, this is of interest so we also have a thing called match uh, statements so in here what happens is we are matching based on the value of what I get from this variable so in here so this 
this one, string of array animals has an array of some string values. So each of that has different values. Even though that's a string, it has different string values. Let's say you want to match for a specific value, you can use this match state. Say that okay. If that uh, the value of animal is mouse, do this. If it is dog or something else, do that. So this is a binary O. And finally, if you say underscore, that means I don't care. Whatever it is. Can you also do matching based on types? Yes. So match is very powerful. Uh, match is like a super steroid version of uh, case statements. Yeah. You can yeah. Yeah. You know, you check it by yourself all the time. You can just use match and that's it. Yeah. You can do almost anything with match. Basically, you can take a value and break it up and look at its fields and based on that, choose a match and extreme part. There's a version of this coming even for JavaScript. There's a proposal for match for JavaScript. This is in Rust and Swift. This concept of type matching is now. So it's like the case statement, the switch statement, but way more powerful than your switch statement. But it would be a, a single expression is executed. Only one expression is executed. Okay. Which one is depends on the order and the yeah. so, so the, the first first one which fits. first one matches its yeah. okay. Some logic here, so if the input is less than something, less than some 
value and just going to return an error. I'm just throwing, I'm not throwing an error, I'm just returning an error. So throwing an error in Bell is uh, you can uh, we call it panic. So when you panic, the error is uh, thrown. The third case is uh, just the actual value. Uh, that means I return the actual uh, expected time. So first one, if I call this, uh, so the return type is some uh, JSON or error here. So I have to do, so the first one, how do I handle an error in this scenario? Is the first option is I will do a type test. If the return value is of type which I accept, I do my uh, what I intended to do. Or else, okay, this is an error. The other one is you can defer the error handling. Basically, you can just uh, lift the error using this notation. So in this case, uh, the variable balance will have a, so when there's an error, the error gets assigned to the balance. And you can just uh, use have handling the, like this in this case. And uh, the other statement where you can eliminate error is using the check uh, unary expression. So what happens here is that whatever comes uh, after uh, evaluating this is the expected type from that uh, function. The error is basically checked. It will, it will be uh, handled by some other. It's returned from the function. Yeah, it's returned from the function. That's why we have a uh, uh, return statement here. And uh, the other one is, let's say the function throws or oh, panics an error, then you have to use the, let's say you want to handle that runtime, panic means that runtime error. So you want to handle that, so you can use the expression track, which will basically track that panic error. Then you, it will be assigned to this uh, value, you can, after that you can handle. So that's it. That's it for your try catches. Yeah. Um, I have a question. And so far, it seems uh, very powerful things you can do, and you are also very flexible and have a lot of options of how you do things. But in the beginning, you said your one goal is to have a good readability. So doesn't that contradict a little bit? If I have four options for doing something, and somebody can 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 do it very differently in one different program. parts of the program. And, and I want to read and understand that. Yeah. Uh, so error handling is one where we have to do that in order to support different kinds of use cases. Okay. So panic and error, there's no way around it. You have to be able to return an error, and sometimes you have to be able to abort. Mm -hmm. Panic is abort, is, is throw exception in Java to speak. Uh, what that does, of course, is unwinds a call step until somebody stops it. It doesn't get stopped, that entire worker will die. So, so panics are avoidable because there are certain things you have to be able to avoid. Mm -hmm. So there, there has to be a way to handle panics a bit differently. So the, the reason we went away from try catch syntax is because a lot of the people who are coming to this language are people who are familiar with Java or C++ or C Sharp or JavaScript where you have try catch. But that is the way you handle errors. And we don't want to encourage you to handle errors by throwing exceptions. It's the wrong way to handle errors. The better way to handle errors is to say, I have an error, it's a normal return. An error is a normal return. And you need to be aware of that. And if you don't want to handle that, you can propagate it up. Right? So it's not really two or three options. It's like no option two for a second. And if you know option two, then one and three. Uh, one is saying, I want to handle the error. Three is saying, I don't want to handle the error, I want to propagate it one level up. So it's explicit error propagation, one level up. Right? Trap is saying, this is a panic, I want to handle the panic. If there is a panic that happens, yeah, I want to handle it. It converts a panic to an error, basically, what trap does. So really, these are necessary uh, choices for the different scenarios that you have to handle errors in. So it is a bit annoying, I agree, uh, but there's kind of no way out of it. Um, how does it work in, for option two if I want to defer the error handling? So I I assign them the error from the account invocation to the balance variable. But 
No, no, the, the, that's not what it's doing. So the, the, this is also going to go a little bit further. Let me explain what this is doing. This is saying if <coughs> this is called error lifting. So it's like this lifts like, like nil lifting, but it's error lifting. So if a comp is not an error, just navigate to the balance field and get the balance field value. If the value of the account is an error, then return the error. Okay, and even if, if the error is panic in the function, I still get the error as a error. No, panic is panic. Panic cannot be caught with this. Panic can only be caught with trap. Okay. Your panic is like normal exception unwinding. So if a panic happens in a, in a call stack, right, then you will keep unwinding the call stack until you find somebody who says trap. Okay, so that means if, if inside the function the, panic, uh, the error is panic, uh, yeah, if the code is not executed, the value will be yes. Yeah, just so the code will go off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's right. This will not, uh, yeah, we will not stop it. Okay. So will, only trap will stop panic. Panics are basically things that, that are not really handleable. Out of memory is a panic. There's nothing you can do about out of memory. Out of memory, you're done. You can't really handle it and come back. Still uh, print various uh, different messages, so you still have the uh, panic message that I have thrown when you yeah, the, the, the error stuff is also evolving. There's a little bit of cleanup cleanup happening on the error stuff. So don't get too mad with this bit of it. Concepts are the same, the details are evolving a little bit. You have to make it a bit tighter than what we are now. The same concepts. Okay, so we are supposed to wait for lunch at 12. I think it's about 12. We need to put behind that at but that's okay. We'll figure it out. So, shall we? Uh, any other questions? Yeah. All right, shall we take a lunch break and come back then? Thank you. Uh, 1 o'clock, shall we start with this? So, 53 minutes lunch break. Absolutely. <laughs>